Hi, I'm Magalie Laguerre Wilkinson. Science and You starts now. I'm Donna Hanover, you're on Candid Camera. And by the way, we'll take your DNA. That's what's happening to endangered species in the wild thanks to some impressive technology. Ahead on Science and You. I'm Mike Gilliam, coming up on Science and You. Did you hear that? I think he just said hello. But is that parrot really thinking or is he just reciting? In just a minute, we're gonna to try to figure out the bird's brain on Science and You. Hi, I am Marlene Peralta. Do you know that owning a pet just like Pepper can improve your life? I'll tell you ahead on Science and You. I'm Magalie Laguerre Wilkinson. What is it with pets and people? A noted anthropologist provides some perspective on the animal and human connection. Coming up on Science and You. I'm Carol Ann Riddell. Many of us treat our dogs more like members of the family than household pets, but how much do we really understand why they do what they do? Today we take a closer look at the science of dog behavior. That's ahead on Science and You. I'm Donna Hanover. We'll take your photo or your DNA, thank you. That's how scientists from the Wildlife Conservation Society are tracking and saving endangered species in the wild with some high-tech equipment. The Bronx Zoo, which is the headquarters of the organization, has long been proud of the exotic animals visitors can see, like the popular and endangered snow leopard. But one of the WCS's most dramatic recent finds on the other side of the globe is a group of the snow leopards still surviving in the high mountains of Afghanistan. It's a thrilling discovery because there are thought to be fewer than 7,500 of them on the planet. Science has led the way in finding these animals as they were recorded on camera traps similar to these, many of which were set by the 59 rangers the WCS hired in that country. The traps put time, date, and temperature stamps on the photos. Peter Zoller, deputy director for the Asia program of the WCS, explains that the camera traps have two parts, a camera and a collector. They, they line them up in such a way so that an infrared beam operates going across the area where they hope an animal will pass. Usually you set it up between, for example, two rocks. Any animal or other object that crosses the beam of the infrared uh, from the camera sets off the camera and you get a picture. So you get pictures sometimes of, of windblown leaves and small birds, but you also get pictures of snow leopards. Another way WCS scientists find and count exotic animals in the wild is through their DNA. They get it, not all that glamorously, from scat samples. For Marco Polo sheep, which is the largest wild sheep in the world, it actually has horns that when they, they curl around twice and they're basically six feet from tip to tip, enormous animals. So what we do is we collect their, their dung um, and get DNA samples from this, which tells us essentially the relatedness of individual animals to each other and groups of animals. These scientific technologies are important because once there is data confirming there are animals to protect, the WCS tries to help the local population conserve them as a valuable resource. In the case of the snow leopards, local people are now working against poaching that has long occurred for furs and medicinal uses. As for other dangers, shepherds have sometimes killed the snow leopards to keep them from harming livestock. The people up in the mountains are really living right on the edge. They're extremely poor, so loss of livestock can really have an effect. We're actually working with communities now to build such things as predator-proof corrals to keep snow leopards from being able to get at livestock during the evenings. And we're working on a community insurance programs so that animals that are taken by animals such as snow leopards um, can be comp the local people can be compensated, and thus they will not have a reason to go out and kill snow leopards in retaliation. We are primarily encountering very warm, welcoming villagers. They're interested in what we're doing, and we can't operate without their help and their permission, essentially. And they have granted it to us every time. As for the science involved in their work here and in more than 60 countries around the globe, the Wildlife Conservation Society finds that different environments require different adaptations. What is the, the protection for the camera? Yeah, they, they make 
uh, small plastic boxes um, that are made differently depending on the kind of conditions that we put them in. And in a situation like the high mountains of Afghanistan, the issue primarily is snow and very, very low temperatures. But we, we use these kinds of cameras elsewhere in, in the middle of the tropical rainforests of, of Asia and, and Africa, for example. And there you have very different conditions and you have different constructed boxes. But it's, it is very critical to have the right kind of, of safety measures around the cameras. Zoller says next up is capture recapture technology, camera traps that help confirm the markings and identities of individual animals by photographing them from both sides at the same time. So success in finding and tracking some pockets of endangered animals has clearly fired up scientists to put in place even more sophisticated technology to make sure these creatures continue gracing our planet. I'm Donna Hanover for Science and You. Between three and four million cats and dogs are adopted from animal shelters every year. I'm Mike Gilliam. Did you ever go to a pet store and hear the parrot speaking to you? Maybe saying hi or how are you? And maybe you responded and they answered you back. It makes you wonder, are they actually thinking or are they just reciting? To answer that question, we went to the parrot expert. Check it out. Parrots come in many shapes and sizes, and a lot of them talk, but not many as much as those trained by Dr. Irene Pepperberg. But are they really thinking? It depends on the bird and depends on the training, okay? For our birds, they definitely knew what they were saying. They definitely understood everything. For the average bird in someone's home, they may or may not. It may just be a simple stimulus response reaction. It depends on how the bird is trained. Pepperberg is an adjunct professor at Brandeis University and a research associate at Harvard. For 30 years, until he died, she trained perhaps the most famous parrot of all time, Alex. How many? How many, Keith? Two. You're right. What's different? What's different? Color. That's right. And what color bigger? What color bigger? Good birdie. Oh, you're such a good boy. Yeah. Give me a feel for, for the things that you taught him that make you know he was thinking. Okay, well first we learned to identify about 50 different objects. He learned seven colors and five shapes. He learned quantities up to eight by the time he died. He learned to combine these labels to identify, request, refuse, and categorize more than 100 different things in the laboratory. He understood concepts of category. So I could show him something and say, you know, what color, what shape, what matter, and what toy. And he'd give me all the different answers depending on what I was asking. So he was attending to my questions. He wasn't just spouting stuff. Right. He had to listen, you know, she wants green or does she want four corner? He understood concepts of same and different, so you could show him two things. And he'd tell you what was same or different, the color, the shape, the material. Or he'd say none if nothing were same or different. How many green wool? Four. Good parent. Good boy. So he knew that six was represented six blobs of something, but he also understood that six represented a single squiggle. Okay? And then without training, he learned to order the Arabic numbers. Now, this is our bird. This is Oscar and Oscar's keeper, Vicky. So here's the question. Is he smart? Is he really thinking? Or does he just recite? He's really thinking, definitely. He does a lot of association. He uh, is an independent thinker. When the phone rings, he says hello before I can even get to the phone and say hello. If I put my coat on and I go to zip it, before I can even zip the jacket, he does the zipping sound. Does he talk? He talks a lot, all day long, chatter, chatter, chatter. Hello, how are you, who are you? I'm Oscar, O-S-C-A-R, Apple. Come on, come Is on. Is he published yet? Not yet. <laughs> <laughs> Soon, we're working on it. <laughs> so, back to that original question. Are they thinking or just reciting? My parents really understood what was going on. They had the intelligence, Alex had the intelligence of a five or six year old child, and we documented that and every, pretty much everything he said has some kind of meaning. So, there you have it. 
You've heard it from the expert, and you've also heard it from the parrot owners. They are thinking, especially if you train them correctly. I'm Mike Gilliam for Science and You. What is the difference between the frog and the toad? Think moisture. Frogs are generally water loving, spend most of their adult lives in water, and they have a smooth skin. These are common names. They're not perfectly adequate. Some, some people would disagree on what's a frog, what's a toad. But to me, toads are on land. You find them on land, they're warty skins. Everything else is a frog. And so why are frogs so slimy? They're slimy because they have glands, moisture producing and, and mucus secreting glands throughout their skin. Um, it's functional insofar as uh, many frogs breathe uh, th breathe through their skin. They have lungs, but they also, at least all but uh, one species has lungs, um, but they also respire. They have gas exchange through the skin, and it's necessary that that be a, a wet surface to facilitate the oxygen and carbon dioxide moving across the boundary. I am Marlene Peralta. The bond between humans and animals have existed for centuries making it perhaps the most important friendship in history. Experts agree that the benefits from these mutual interactions are priceless. Animal behaviorist Peter Voschel says the similarities between humans and animals are endless. We're social and dogs are social, so the, we, we all live in groups. We don't do well sort of as hermits. And um, that gives us a base of commonality and dogs, you know, they like being with groups of people, and they probably started off coming to us for food, hanging around settlements and encampments for the leftovers. Um, and then we found them to be helpful. They bark, alert us when the enemies would come, and they would keep us warm in the winter, somebody to play with. So it was a mutual uh, interaction from the beginning. Humans' fascination for animals keeps on growing. In fact, the latest National Pet Owner Survey reveals that almost 72 million households own a pet. Humane Society animal consultant and trainer Bill Berloni has a unique perspective on why that bond continues to happen. I've been training animals for 30 years now, and I had a dog growing up. And, you know, dogs and cats are particularly good because they'll, they'll, move, they'll live with humans. You know, they're one of the two species that will have actually been domesticated and will live with us. And, um, you know, I feel that in our hectic society, you know, what animals give us is unconditional love. And so I think we're drawn to that as, as humans, you know, coming home and having a companion that we can talk to, that we know won't treat us like another human, but just give us the good emotional feeling. And those emotional feelings come with no judgment. Now, Willis does not know that you know, the sweater is new, and or that I got my hair done, or a makeover, or whatever, whatever. He doesn't care. I could be in curlers and, you know, cold cream. It doesn't matter. They just see you. And I always tell kids, wouldn't it be nice if we could just treat our classmates like our dogs treat us for just five minutes a day? You don't judge anybody for what they own or what they look like or whatever. You just see them. Animals have been part of our lives from the beginning of time. There's been a lot of years for it to develop. We know for pretty much of a fact that dogs have been domesticated and living with people for at least 15,000 years. And there's some evidence, maybe a little controversial, that it might be as long as 100 or 150,000 years. So that's a lot of generations for dogs and for us to sort of get mutually compatible. But do pets benefit as much as we do from this bond? Three square meals a day, or two, or maybe one, a place to sleep, which is very comfortable, usually right next to us, and uh, uh, companionship, what's, what's not to like? <laughs> Even those in the animal science profession can take advantage of that unbreakable friendship. The human-animal bond is one of the cornerstones of our profession. And in fact, the, there's a group I'm associated with called the Association for Veterinary Family Practice. And one of the reasons that we emphasize the concept of family practice is that veterinary technology and veterinary medicine are not fields for people who like animals and don't like people. Because you know what? The dog doesn't drive himself to the vet. And the cat doesn't come up to you and say, you know, I'm due for vaccines. 
the relationship between the human and the animal are what drives how well the animal is taken care of. For those professionals working with shelter animals like Berloni, that human-animal bond is what he looks for when matching his animals with a new family. We're matchmakers. These poor creatures have already been abandoned once by humankind, so we try to make the match that's going to be forever. If you're looking for a boyfriend, you wouldn't walk into the first bar on the corner, sit down next to a guy and marry him. Fortunately, a lot of people do that. They'll go into a pet shop and they'll be visually drawn to a puppy, whether it's right for them or not. And we try to educate the puppy, the people, as to what the right dog is for their life. So it's a forever match. All experts agree that education is the key to make this bond work. Places like Humane Society use education to make a happy match for all the animals they have available for adoption. For more on this relationship, we go to my colleague, Magali Lager Wilkinson. We're exploring the relationship that has evolved between human beings and animals since, you guessed it, the Stone Age. A new book suggests it's taken root since that far back. A new book titled The Animal Connection by anthropologist Pat Shipman says the human-animal relationship goes beyond just household pets and began millions of years ago. People have not paid enough attention to the connection between animals and people and they haven't realized before how ancient it is and how important it is and how much it had to do with making humans the way humans are now. Hello. We have been intimately connected with animals for at least two and a half million years. That's way before we were modern humans. And all through our evolution from then until now, we have reaped advantages to paying attention to animals, to responding to animals, to understanding animals. Shipman explains how this relationship manifested itself into something closer. It starts with the beginning of tool making. And from the earliest tools that we have, which is 2.6 million years, we know because of the evidence that those tools were being used to access animal foods that our ancestors could not get before then. They didn't have the equipment. We're not built like predators. You don't have long claws, big fierce teeth, tremendous speed, acute sense of smell, big upper body strength to pull down an antelope. We can't do that. We seem to be the only species that can find a link with another species. My argument is partly we do this because there's a huge payoff for us, and we have, in fact, involved, evolved to be involved with animals. If you're at all interested in your animal, and most people are very interested in them, you soon pick up on their behaviors. And because you are communicating with them, you need a response from them that says, oh yeah, I get it, this means sit, or this means don't pee on the carpet. But they're also training you, if you tell me don't pee on the carpet and I do this, you better take me outside or we're going to have an unhappy time. <laughs> and it's going to be your fault. <laughs> right, and it's going to be your fault because you weren't listening to me. So there is very much a two-way street in developing this conversation and this mutual language that it's you say something, I as the animal respond, I say something, you need to respond. The saying that we all use for dogs, man's best friend, there is truth to that. Yes, there is. And dogs were the first species we domesticated, which I think is, is very crucial. We have been living with dogs, interacting with dogs, taking dogs into our families for tens of thousands of years. There are going to be people who, who are animal crazy. There are going to be people on the other extreme who really could care less. But it's in our genes. Continued evidence that the human and animal connection is rooted in our DNA. I'm Magalie Laguerre Wilkinson for Science and You. Good boy. It's estimated that $50.84 billion will be spent on our pets in the United States in 2011. 
I'm Carol Ann Riddell. We love them, we live with them, but how much do we really understand about why our dogs behave the way they do? Today we take a closer look at what science can teach us about our dogs. In the human world, this would be a downright rude way to greet a stranger, though it's perfectly acceptable behavior among our canine friends. So have you ever wondered why dogs say hello with their noses in seemingly all the wrong places? Julie Hacked, a canine behavioral researcher, has an answer. The idea is that dogs don't hug each other, they don't shake hands, they have their own ways of greeting each other, and there are certain parts on, of their body that have a lot of information um, that are excreting pheromones. So the behind gives a lot of information. There's a lot of, um, there's a lot of pheromones that are emitted from that area, also parts of their face, their mouth. That's how they get the most information about one another. So now on a different note. As part of my lesson in Dog Science 101, Julie and I spent some time at Animal Haven, a shelter in Lower Manhattan, and also at my apartment with our much-loved family mutt Hudson. As Julie explains, there are many amazing things dogs do that we humans simply take for granted. For example, we don't often think about it, but dogs have learned to bark differently depending on what they're trying to communicate to us. In this case, Hudson desperately wants her ball and signals that with a more high-pitched bark. So she's barking, she's looking. The dog tied to a tree, the alone bark, is very different from the go away bad stranger bark. And when we create experiments to say, how are they different and can we as humans understand these barks? The answer is yes. Another fascinating behavior dogs display, watch how Hudson pays attention when Julie points. Let's say there's a bee, right? A bee is flying around this room and I tell the bee, go outside. He's not attending to my pointing gesture, even though I'm clearly offering him help. The window's over there, dude, go out the window. Um, with a dog, they understand from a very early age, there's some learning involved, but they understand that when we point to something, I'm not talking about the tip of my finger. I'm talking about something after my finger. My finger is drawing a line to something else. But it's easy for people to misunderstand what dogs are communicating to each other. Watching Oprah and King at Animal Haven, you might not know if this is playful behavior or not. Um, like she's in, but she's not in to the same degree uh, that um, King is. Is she annoyed? A little annoyed. Oh. Oprah's kind of letting her know I'm not the biggest fan of the way you're playing. Part of learning about dog behavior is recognizing what dogs may not be capable of, particularly when it comes to more sophisticated feelings. Do you think we project a lot of emotions on dogs that they don't actually feel? Definitely. And that can become a problem, especially when it comes to training a dog. Tiffany Lacey, executive director at Animal Haven, explains. One of the biggest mistakes is that people think that dogs should know certain things that they just don't. Dogs do not want revenge, they never do. They're never trying to get back at anyone. They just have to go to the bathroom and they're just gonna do it where they know and they've been trained to do it. So when your dog misbehaves and looks guilty, is it really feeling that or just responding to a cue you've given? From my study I found that dogs who offer these guilty looks are scolded less. So the idea could be by showing these behaviors, it kind of shuts you up, it kind of calms you down. Who's the master there? The dogs. <laughs> <laughs> but that's interesting. So what the dog really in that case is responding to is just a learned behavior of if I look guilty, yeah. you'll back off. Exactly. So I'm gonna look Whether or not dogs feel emotion the way many of us believe they do is a matter of debate. The big question? Do you think that our dogs love us? I think, yeah, I think they're very attached to us. Ah, that's the science. <laughs> but even the more scientific dog lovers can be swayed. So do our dogs really know and feel all that we think they do? The scientific evidence is unclear, but a lot of dog owners will tell you man's best friend is nothing less than exactly that. I'm Carol Ann Riddell for Science and You. That's our show for today. Thanks for joining us. I'm Magalie Laguerre-Wilkinson. See you next time on Science and You.